Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. This week, U.S. Farm Report concerns itself with agriculture in the Boot Heel area of Missouri and in the adjacent area of northern Arkansas. Now, as you know, when you talk about agriculture in the Missouri Boot Heel, you must necessarily talk about cotton because cotton is one of the Boot Heel's leading crops. And when this reporter mentions cotton, it harkens us back to 1969, the month of December, and the NFO National Convention in Louisville, Kentucky. At that time, U.S. Farm Report cameras and microphones recorded the following interview with a dynamic young man from the Boot Heel of Missouri, Gideon, Missouri, Murray Wallace, who heads up NFO's rather new cotton program. Murray Wallace was there in attendance at the convention with his lovely wife. Murray, Missouri, I don't believe, is particularly famous for uh, cotton, but uh, now you tell me that, uh, by golly, the right. cotton production there is sizable. Right, Bill. We have seven counties in the Boot Hill that produce enough cotton to made our product number one in the state. Now, we've had some years that we weren't so fortunate, but we have a product that has been one in state agriculture uh -huh. list. What county is your home county, Murray? New Madrid. New, New Madrid, Madrid County, Missouri. Uh -huh. uh, Murray, uh, here at uh, the convention, I had the pleasure of hearing you address the convention very briefly. I think they gave you all of 60 seconds to announce a cotton meeting that you felt was most important. What's the plight of the cotton producer these days, and what do you think was accomplished here at the convention in your cotton meeting? Bill, the cotton producer has almost lost the battle. We, in the South, as I said earlier, lost a war a little over 100 years ago. This war is an economic war. We've almost lost it. We're looking to NFO to help us out of this problem. We mm -hmm. only think that going national through a collective bargaining on a national scale can we get our markets and bargain for cotton. We are selling it for less than what it costs to produce a bale of cotton yeah. right now in 1969. And at this convention, I have met delegates from cotton counties from Carolinas to California who have received this program with 200% enthusiasm. Not 100, but they say, come on down and put us in it. Well, now, I know that NFO for quite some time has been working on a cotton program. And in fact, uh, Ron, uh, U.S. Farm Report had the pleasure of uh, touring some of the cotton areas of your state of California. And uh, we interviewed, by the way, a couple of fellas out there, the Waddy brothers. And I know that you're acquainted with them, are you not? Yes, that is correct. They're in Tulare County. Bill. That's right. And uh, they were telling us much the same story as you, Murray, about the plight of the cotton farmer. For example, uh, as I recall, it used to be that the gins would gin the cotton uh, just in exchange for the cotton seed. But it's a far cry from that today, isn't it? Uh, now I understand that the, the gins get the cotton seed, but in addition to that, it costs, what, seven or eight or nine dollars a bale? Correct, Bill. There's a debit on it now. Is this your situation in Missouri? Exactly. We have a debit side out of the cotton lint, the mm -hmm. fiber, to pay for the cost of ginning because of the low prices that we are now receiving yeah. in all sections of not only Missouri, but of all cotton producing states in this country. Well, Murray, uh, in the cotton meeting that occurred here in uh, Louisville, uh, what are some of the points that were made and uh, what do you think this is really going to mean to the uh, cotton grower? To the cotton grower, I'm answering your last question first. This is, means more dollars in his pocket he simply cannot continue to grow and produce a crop that he is selling at a loss. This program has several points that we're going into. The first thing is we're going on selling cotton, not disposing of it, on a national level. No other organization in the cotton belt has tried this. We will succeed. We have acceptance in all areas. We've held meetings, not only here in Louisville, but in areas from California to Carolinas, across the entire South. We have a program. We know the American housewife, the consumer, desires cotton. Yes. It is more desirable than synthetics. We are going to sell our product and not give it away, as has been done over the last few years. We have had a decline in our market price of almost 33% mm -hmm. in the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. Our U.S. Farm Report crew flew into the airport at Gideon, Missouri, in the Boot Heel area of Missouri, 
to be met by farmer, businessman, NFO leader, Arthur Duncan. There follows now for you the Arthur Duncan story. Arthur, how many acres are you farming here? We're farming approximately 1,150 acres. And uh, what are you growing on this land? Well, we're growing uh, wheat, as you can see here in the background, and uh, we're growing cotton, soybeans, and corn. This wheat looks wonderful. It looks real good, considering the kind of winter we've had. I well, that looks this good. You've had a bad winter for this part of Missouri, haven't you? We've had an exceptionally wet winter, and we've had, uh, I believe, 16 snows, which is very unusual for our area. There haven't been large snows, but uh, it's been a very unusual yeah. winter. Let's talk a little bit about your, uh, your cotton. Uh, this is uh, cotton country down here. Uh, is it depressed? Well, is it depressed? Uh, I should say it is. We actually have always thought of in Missouri, the boot heel of Missouri, cotton was king. But this is no longer so. Cotton has lost uh, its place in this part of the country as far as being the number one crop. Uh, it has been so depressed that the cotton uh, no longer can compete uh, with other crops in uh, the amount of uh, income that it produces. Mm -hmm. The cost of producing a cotton crop has come to grow so fast through chemicals and uh, we've lost, as you know, our labor. We've got to do it by getting bigger. This costs more investment. Mm -hmm. uh, we pick all of our cotton by mechanical pickers and this machinery is extremely high and we can only use this machine for about six weeks a year. It's good for nothing but to pick cotton. Boy, you know, you've got a lot of dollars invested in a lot of equipment that uh, some uh, 45, 46 weeks out of every year lies idle. That's, that's true. This is the thing that hurts so uh -huh. bad in, in cotton. And uh, if we don't have a price for our cotton, we just don't have any way of keeping operating. Well, let's mention one other thing about your production costs in cotton, and that's the ginning process. Now. Out in Tulare, California, two or three months ago, a uh, U.S. Farm Report did a show on cotton. We had some good NFO out there who explained to us that it used to be, and not too long ago, that they could take their cotton to a gin, get it ginned uh, in exchange for the cotton seed. And in fact, uh, they would come out with a, a few extra dollars that was paid to them by the gin. But that's not so anymore, is it? No, it isn't, uh, Bill. Here, we uh, used to could do this same thing. We used to take our cotton to have it ginned. Uh, we would come out with maybe 6 to $8 a bale refund over the price of the cotton seed mm -hmm. for the ginning and wrapping of this cotton. It has got to the point now that uh, you can hardly find anyone that would even gin the cotton for the seed and then they would charge you extra for wrapping it. And I have paid in this past year as much as $9 a bale above the price of the cotton seed to get my cotton ginned and wrapped. Well now, to indicate uh, with some degree of emphasis, I think, the depressed uh, area that this is in cotton, uh, one of the gins has uh, closed its door, so to speak, and in fact, you've taken it over for storage purposes and so forth. Yes, right? this is true. Uh, there have been many gins have closed. Many of them. Many, in many area. of them. It's uh, it's ridiculous to think of the investment these people have had that they have actually lost because uh, cotton no longer is leading uh, in agriculture yeah. in this area. Now, the gin uh, that I bought. Uh, uh, was closed. Uh, the last year it operated was 1965. And because of uh, the uh, cotton problem, they were no long, longer able to stay mm -hmm. in business. And uh, they just had to, well, just almost go into bankruptcy, just walk off and leave yes. the operation. Yes. Now, something is being done about it, however, we're happy to report. NFO does have a new cotton program. What effect has this new NFO program had, Arthur? Well, it has had very little effect to this time. Is it because it's so new? That's true. This program was only started in our area late in November. Now, many of the farmers, including NFO farmers, had not even known of this program in November, mm -hmm. and consequently they sold their cotton for a price of uh, about 35 to 50 points above the government loan. Now this means to two dollars to two dollars and a half per bale uh, to the farmer over the government loan yeah. price. Now he has been so depressed uh, and the 
cotton that he has put in the loan in the past. He hasn't seen anything done with it. So uh, if he could get uh, a couple of dollars a bale more, he felt like he'd just better sell it because that's more than he'd get if he went to the loan. Mm -hmm. However, uh, many farmers in this area like myself did not sell their cotton. We felt that if there was no place in NFO for it, at least we wasn't going to give it to them. We wasn't going to put it on the market. They were going to have to get it from our government. They wasn't going to get it from us. Yeah. Now, by not selling this cotton, we got a program started late in November. We signed up cotton in our county that was in the loan to be sold through NFO. And Mr. Murray Wallace, who is uh, a resident of our county, has headed up the cotton commodity program for a NFO. fine young man, by the way, and a very enthusiastic young fellow. I agree with you 100%. Yes, indeed. We feel like he's doing a wonderful job for us. It's brand new to him. He has uh, traveled, as you know, all across the Cotton Belt, holding meetings, uh, telling them about this program, how they hope that it will work and how it can work. Mm -hmm. And the big job now is to get the participation of the farmers to support it. We have made a cotton sale through NFO. It has not been a tremendous amount of money more than we could have got anywhere else, but it has been a couple of dollars more a bale than I was offered in the fall. And $2 uh, is $2, $2, and that's a beginning, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The amazing thing, Bill, about this is the buyer has to pay for the interest on our loan. He also has to pay the storage on that cotton since it was harvested last fall. Mm -hmm. And he is still giving us a couple of dollars more than he bought cotton for last fall. So by the time he picks this cotton up out of the warehouse and pays the loan off, his interest and his storage plus the additional money we get is costing him approximately $10 a bale, mm -hmm. more than he bought cotton for last fall. Yes. Now, if we can educate the membership in NFO to participate, to sign up their cotton to be sold through NFO, then there's no reason why we can't get this 8 or $10 more at harvest time rather than to wait to this time of the year. Right. And right. we feel like that this is a tremendous program. It's a natural program for us because cotton... Uh, is stored in federal warehouses. We have the government loan to fall back on to uh, just about get our cost for production is about what it amounts mm -hmm. to. Then we have something to bargain with. Yes. We still have our cotton. Well, then, Arthur, you don't even have to touch that cotton again. That's true. Uh, we only have the warehouse receipt uh, that we get our money on from the ASCS office. And what we're actually selling is our equities when mm -hmm. we find the buyer. Mm -hmm. And uh, by doing this, we have a natural because yeah. we don't have to touch it. All we have to do is have NFO to find a buyer for us to agree to accept the price they bring back to us. And when we do this, it just collect our money. Uh, NFO, it's a wonderful program. Yes, I'm sure it is. And I think that it will probably get better as time goes by. I'm as sure as you are. Uh, Arthur, uh, NFO is making some good accomplishments in this area with soybeans. This is true, too. Uh, for an example, last week I was trying to bargain for a sale of NFO soybeans, and uh, I got a price from one uh, processor who uh, gave us a fair bid considering the market. However, I got a price from another. I'm sure this man uh, realized I was dealing with other people, and although the market dropped, a half a cent a bushel the, after he gave me his bid that day and before the market opened the next morning he had done bid two cents a bushel higher but the market had went down mm -hmm. so this shows us that they know if they're not going to get the beans they're willing to bid a little higher and try to keep the beans from moving out of their area into someone else's marketing area these beans were stored, weren't they? These were farm-stored beans. And so here was a perfect example of uh, the NFO philosophy in action of storing together, holding together, and bargaining together, selling together. This is true, and this is what NFO is all about. That's right. And we, in NFO, our biggest problem now is NFO members are getting the other members to see that until we are willing to block our stuff together and sell it together, uh, we can't expect to have any more than we have now. Mm -hmm. I like to think of us as a, as farmers as a yo-yo on a string. And you see, whenever you turn that yo-yo loose, uh, it coasts back up a ways up that string and back down. And every time it gets a little lower. And this is the way we've been in agriculture. And whenever, I like to think that whenever our 
economy sees the danger, then they will ease the market up a little bit to give us greater hopes. And uh, we think, well, we got a pretty fair price for our crop this year, mm -hmm. so next year we might do better. Yeah. And then the yo-yo starts coasting again, yeah. you see. I like that. And I like to think of it this way because I feel like that's exactly where we're at. We have nothing to say at this time as to what we're going to get for what we produce. And we're the only industry in the world that operates this that's way. Right. And we have got to change it. Without a price tag, we cannot exist on the farm and be in agriculture at all. You know, speaking of existing on the farm, now here is a way of life that you've chosen. You want to be a farmer. And yet uh, you find yourself having to go into other businesses to generate income in order to maintain your agricultural way of life. Now, what businesses are you in besides farming? Well, I have a heating and air conditioning business, and uh, I am in the LP gas business. Mm -hmm. uh, these have been a, quite an asset to my operation. Uh, however, I've seen many times when we have to work way into the night uh, on the farm and uh, then go out and work on a job somewhere else. And without this other business, I wouldn't even have what I've got today. Mm -hmm. There wouldn't have been any way to stay here. There are many, many farmers that are just as ambitious as I am, but they don't have the, uh, haven't had the ability or were not fortunate enough to have other trades that they could fall back on for a, a extra income. Mm -hmm. And I know we all need to diversify. But it uh, seems incredible when we think of the amount of unemployment in the country that a man on a farm would have to work from 16 to 18 hours to make a living that we're used to living uh, with. And uh, just because we're farmers, you know, uh, is no reason for us to run around in our overhauls and our gum boots seven days a week. And uh, a lot of people seem to look to farmer as with this uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. they, they like to... Uh, when they see NFO go into a holding action or something, uh, the first thing they want to look at is how many new cars they've got. Uh, how nice a home do they live in? And we feel like in agriculture we have the right to uh, be on a level with the rest of the economy of our nation. And we shouldn't have to live in uh, rundown shacks. We should be able to live like anyone else in the world. And we have a tremendous investment in agriculture. What do you have invested here? Well, uh, approximately, I would imagine, in the neighborhood of $230,000. Are you realizing as much as a 3% return on that investment? This is just about what I realize. Uh, Does that include your labor? 3% uh, will almost cover the investment and the labor. Um, I just made mention a while ago that if we could get for our investment, or if we could get on the market what we have invested uh, seven to eight percent would be more than we make, including our labor and our investment. A tremendous amount more. After visiting with Arthur Duncan in the Boot Heel area of Missouri at Gideon, we went aboard our airplane and in less than an hour's flying time landed at the airport at Wynn, Arkansas. Here we visited with Bill Owen, attorney turned farmer. Bill, I would imagine that uh, this country really gets under your skin, particularly if you get away from it. If you go north or you get into the swing of the city, uh, it's probably a nice thing to get back, isn't it? Oh, it is, Bill. I'll tell you, uh, there are not many places in America today where you can uh, walk out your back door and in 10 minutes uh, be at your duck blind, and that's the position I'm in farming here in Arkansas in the rice belt. Well, now, you're a native uh, southerner, a native to this part of the country. Where, where did you grow up, Bill? Well, I grew up and uh, got my education in Memphis, Tennessee, and then uh, went to the University of Michigan, the University of Michigan Law School in Ann Arbor. Have you practiced law? No. Uh, when I got out of law school, I uh, didn't practice. Uh, uh, my family had uh, purchased this farm, uh, Second Growth Timberland, as an investment. And uh, during the summers, I had worked over here for an, an electric cooperative and became enchanted with the countryside and came on over and decided to give it a whirl as to being a farmer and develop this second growth timberland. I have no idea what the statistics might be applying to your situation, but I would venture to say very few farmers today uh, actually have an urban background. Usually these are 
are people whose families for maybe three or four generations have been on the farm. Well, this is true. Very few of us in agriculture and very few people that uh, I've met in, uh, uh, in the agricultural field have an urban background, yeah. but I, I, had, uh, I had to learn everything the hard way uh, as far as agriculture was concerned. I didn't know the difference between a um, hex head bolt or cap screw or broad <laughs> axe or chopping axe. Uh, yeah. It was all strange and new to me. How many acres of land uh, do you farm here? There are 732 in the place, and uh, we farm 640. And you're basically uh, growing grain, aren't you? Right, soybeans and rice. Well, how has it been uh, in this area? What about your price structure for grain, Bill? Has it been a pretty tough situation? Yes, uh, as far as rice is concerned, uh, we're operating on a, relatively speaking, the same price structure as we were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we've only been able to uh, maintain any sort of economic position uh, because of our increased production. Yeah. But we've reached a plateau now, and we are definitely in a cost-price squeeze. Now, has there been much effort through this part of Arkansas toward corporate farming or large farming? Yes, uh, I wouldn't say a large effort, but there is, uh, uh, has been a, uh, some effort. Uh, we have what we call the Delta Farms. Uh, east of us some miles over here across Crawley's Ridge. They have land here in Louisiana and other states. And uh, it's a very large corporate operation. Bill, do you have any idea how they're doing? Well, according to uh, Norman Haig, their general manager, uh, they're in a better position now than they were. At first, they started trying to farm all this acreage uh, themselves, and they found out that it just didn't project uh, in reality as it did on paper. Now they have innumerable tenants who farm on a share, and they are doing better. But I frankly wonder at the amount of rent, uh, the uh, percentage share that the renter is paying, whether they can continue to uh, attract and, mm -hmm. and hold good tenants. How do you feel about this corporate trend in farming, Bill? Do you feel that the uh, saving of agriculture uh, really is in the saving of the independent farm? Yes, I do, Bill. Uh, I think the family type farm, and let me say here that uh, uh, by family type farm, as far as acreage is concerned, we may be talking about several hundred acres or right. several thousand right. acres. But this is the most efficient unit of production in agriculture today. The corporate farming structure, as evidenced by the experience of Delta Farms, is such that their built in efficiencies are more than overcome by their inefficiencies in having a hierarchy of uh, personnel, uh, managers, sub-managers, foremen, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more efficient than the man who is either own, who either owns his own land or is buying his own land, living and working on it. Bill, when did you first uh, become attracted to NFO? Oh, I don't know, Bill, exactly. Time slips by. It must have been about three years ago. Mm -hmm. Under what circumstances, do you recall? One of their local field men called upon me, a gentleman by the name of Charlie Sisson, and interested me. And uh, after that, he was followed up by a man named Ray Hackler. And I talked with them and uh, read some of their publications and read very thoroughly and digested their contract and was very much impressed. And so you became a member. This is right. What, uh, what do you think about NFO now after having been a member for three years? I think that this is the only group organization in agriculture today that can save the family-type farmer. Uh, the farmer <clears throat> in, American, in the American economy today must be put in a position to price his commodity. Every other businessman does. Professional men price their services based upon their cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Mm -hmm. And for the American farmer to be able to do this is the only way that he can stay in and be a part, a contributing part of the American economic life. Are you a bit disheartened at this time about uh, the possibility of a legislation helping the farmer? Yes, I am, Bill. Uh, before we had the one man, one vote rule and the restructuring of our legislative system, the farm people 
uh, who were a lot more uh, in numbers at that time, had a great voice in their legislative system, but no more. We are only 5.4% of the population, and we have lost our voice. And politics uh, is a numbers game indeed, isn't it? You not? bet it. You uh, bet it is. Well, let's talk a little bit about your other affiliations uh, with uh, agricultural organizations. You belong to the Farm Bureau also, do you not? Yes, this is true, Bill. Um, a year or so ago, I was president of the local chapter here in Cross County, and last fall in December, I was a delegate to their national convention in Washington. Mm -hmm. I uh, still support Farm Bureau. I think if Farm Bureau were out of the picture, we'd have a void in agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I'm very <clears throat> a strong supporter of NFO, and uh, I do not feel that uh, belonging to both organizations is in any way incompatible. You can belong and support both organizations. I think they're both necessary. NFO has the organization, the structure, but it is a self-help organization. And the farmers in, in America today have got to realize that they must participate and they must do the work. NFO has the framework. The farmer himself must do the work. American farmers must grow up. They must become businessmen and price their products accordingly. And the only way, the best way, as I see it, is through this organization, the National Farmers Organization. And that's our coverage of agriculture in the Missouri Boot Heel and the nearby area of northern Arkansas. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week on this station at this same time. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.